Welcome to the next episode of the Dark Web Deacon. Before we begin, be sure to smash that subscribe button, click the bell to turn on notifications. New videos are published every Monday and Thursday, and as always, be sure to like and provide comments. In today's episode, we're going to talk about form jacking. Uh, form jacking is a type of cyber attack where hackers inject malicious JavaScript code into a web page form, most often the payment form at the very end. This is also sometimes referred to as virtual credit card skimming. Uh, when a consumer enters their payment card information and hits submit, the malicious code collects the payment card information and any additional information the consumer may have entered, such as name, address, and phone number. The code then sends this information to a location of the hacker's choosing. The stolen data is sent on the form, usually as a fake image, in the nomenclature of basically fake domain forward slash image. I mean, so it can be very hard, to, if you're, even if you're looking at the code, to know that there's something going on here because there's image tags usually everywhere on a web page form. People ask uh, Dark Web Deacon, why is this a new attack? Well, I see it as a new attack and it's a growing attack for two reasons. One is that, you know, despite e-commerce sites being around for a long time, there's really an increase in the widespread use of third-party components uh, created in the supply chain. So uh, an attacker can easily compromise thousands of sites by merely changing a few lines of code with a third-party library. So let's say that library is used to maybe create a submit button and it's a particular library everyone uses because they like the format or they like some of the actions that it gives. You inject your, the hacker injects code in that third party library and then multiple companies potentially use that library. Also, the other reason is there, there's not much software available currently to protect against this type of attack. So unfortunately, there is no way for a consumer to detect a form jacking attack while it's happening. And it's very difficult even for the merchant or a payment processor to pick up on it. With form jacking, any provider that is downstream from the affected website can also be affected without the provider's knowledge. Uh, when the code on, on the web page is compromised, you don't even have typical hints such as spoofed URLs or non-secure Wi-Fi connections to alert you something is going on. It can take many hours of manual research and work to discover and remove the malicious code um, for companies that are trying to dil at least diligently look at this. Some companies claim that products like antivirus or scanning software can detect instances of this type of attack. Um, and this is true to a certain extent if they are maintaining a list of known form jacking domains and are analyzing the redirects of the browsers uh, to pick up on this type of attack. But this is not always the case. And if the form jacking domain of the hacker is not known on a specific blacklist, it's completely undetectable. Some of the stats that are out there that I've recently seen over the last you know, two, three years, uh, Symantec reported on average 4,800 unique websites are compromised with form jacking each month. Symantec also claimed they block roughly 3 million form jacking attacks in 2018. In July of 2019, uh, research by Risk IQ reported that such attacks by groups such as MatchCard are actually much more widespread than initially believed. And a lot of this is due to the fact that this is a very hard attack to um, detect and a lot of uh, companies don't have the resources um, to kind of manually go through and do, and do some of this, the scans needed and some of the manual oversight to look at, at potentially where they're vulnerable. One of the key players in this space is MagCard, and they are a loose affiliation of attack groups responsible for payment card attacks against such companies as Ticketmaster, Forbes, British Airways, Newegg, just to name a few. Um, they use foreign jacking in web applications, usually in the shopping cart, and proceed to steal credit card information and sell it on the black market. The actual means at which they grab and sell this data is actually really fascinating, and I want to walk you through it. Here's the 11-step process of how an attack like this is executed and why it's lucrative. Step 1. Hackers target a site or a third-party library used by multiple sites. Step 2. Hackers infect the e-commerce site. Step 3. Consumers go through the order process with no known issues. 
Step four, the consumer's credit card and personal information is skimmed and sent to the hacker's database. Step five, hackers pull the stolen information from that database. Step six, they can sell part or all of that database on the dark web. Step seven, they can also leverage the credit cards in that database to purchase merchandise online. Now they don't want to actually ship this merchandise directly to them. They don't want that paper trail. So in step eight, they need to find a way to launder these transactions. The goods are shipped to a pre-selected merchandise mule. Generally, they can find these mules by recruiting online with specific job posts, basically promising the ability to work from home and earn large sums of money in exchange for shipping merchandise with stolen credit cards. Step nine, the mules then work with local shippers while to receive under the table payment to send goods to Eastern European countries, generally speaking. Step 10, once at the destination, the merchandise is fenced to local buyers. And then finally in step 11, attackers may also get a percent of the proceeds from that final sale. So why can't traditional security measures stop form jacking? Well, a company's high-end antivirus software may provide some protection. The mo most commonly used tool to detect unwanted changes to a company's environment is usually File Integrity Monitoring, or FIM for short. When FIM is deployed, it will alert you when it observes changes to the files or folders you've chosen to monitor. But there's a flaw with FIM in regards to form jacking. Traditional FIM tools will only monitor executable files, folders, and systems, along with content files and zip files. It's effective in detecting changes to otherwise unchanging environments, but FIM can't help to detect changes that are made to dynamic environments. So environments that are constantly changing, such as shopping carts, databases, there's no baseline for FIM to check against. And so because of that, it's a very ineffective tool against form jacking. There are a few companies out there, two in particular that I'm aware of, uh, Security Metrics and Uleska. Um, Security Metrics does have a product called Web Page Integrity Monitoring that they claim can help mitigate malicious injected code on your web pages. Uh, Uleska also is another that has the ability to scan a company's website and to check it against basically a blacklist JavaScript library that it keeps. I don't have any experience with either of these products, but for anyone who does, I'd love it if you could add, add some context in the comment section. What's your experience been? How effective has it been? So as a consumer, am I just out of luck? Well, yes and no. Um, I don't wanna give you just generic advice. On this channel, I'm all about trying to give you very specific advice for very specific issues. So when it comes to form jacking, the one thing you can do, especially if you're on a small or medium sized merchant site, is use a secondary credit card and a secondary email. Or a lot of credit card companies give you the ability to create basically a virtual credit card number. So try not to use your primary credit card that maybe you're using for to pay your bills and your utilities. Um, have a secondary backup that you can use for sites that you're not maybe not quite sure of or have a lot of confidence in. Um, these small and medium sized businesses don't have the budget to buy a lot of the, these fancy software packages that are out there that potentially could prevent this or they don't have the capacity and the, the staff to do a lot of the manual scanning and code reviews to really sift through to all of their third party components. So that's the one piece of advice I can give you. Generically, in terms of just general identity protection, there's a lot of things you can do. So if you are a victim of this type of attack, you know, how to, how to mitigate the downstream effect. And I will go that, I have a 10 point checklist that I'll, I will go over now. There are a lot of both free and paid services available to prevent or mitigate identity fraud. Please check out my previous video, Free Identity Theft Protection Advice in Dark Web 101, and I go into really specific detail on this topic. However, my quick 10 point checklist on ID theft protection is as follows. One, make a list of all your online accounts and categorize to help prioritize accounts to secure first. So think about 
creating a checklist of your financial accounts, your social media accounts, and your entertainment accounts. Number two, make an offline list on paper of all your accounts and passwords and store in a secure location. Number three, get your yearly free credit report from all three credit bureaus to get a baseline on your credit history. Tip number four, leverage free dark web scans of emails, SSNs, and phone numbers that are available from several vendors. Tip number five, if you do have kids, freeze your child's credit file if they're under the age of 16 across all three credit bureaus. Number six, lock your credit file in at least one bureau with, an, with online services. Three is ideal and they are mostly free, um, but unfortunately they're not coordinated, so you can't just do it with one bureau and expect your, your credit file to be locked across all three. You kind of need to do, you would have to manually do it across all three. So I recommend at least doing it on one of them and, and chances are that'll at least help mitigate. Number seven, make sure your home Wi-Fi network requires a password to access it. Number eight, uh, have a fake email and random password um, for non-essential online accounts you create. So, um, for example, if you're using, you know, Ryanair or Pottery Barn or, you know, Gardening.com or whatever the, are the kind of non-essential vendors you work with, um, use a separate email that's separate from your main email that's tied to things like your financial accounts. Um, there is the Google Password Checkup extension. Um, if you are using Chrome, um, it is built into the newer versions of Chrome, but if you are using an older version, check out uh, Google Password Checkup extension. What that will do is when you are using the Chrome browser and logging into different websites, it will check if your um, account and password combination have been potentially part of previous breaches and then recommend you change it. And then number 10, uh, use two-factor authentication, 2FA as it's called, on all important accounts if they exist. So with two-factor, what you do is you need a, both a password and also you'll receive a text message with a PIN to log into accounts. Um, so definitely do this for your financial accounts and more and more other services, um, whether that are starting to offer this type of login. So if it is available, make sure you enable it and leverage it. Thanks for watching, and as always, please like, subscribe, and provide comments, and turn on notifications by clicking the bell in order to check out future videos published twice a week.